this morning in your Bibles to uh, Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, chapter 2, 1st, 2nd Chronicles of Ezra, and it's before the Psalms, somewhere in that vicinity. We're going to begin to read it this morning in the, in the first verse. First chapter, first verse. This morning I'm, I'm going to preach on uh, the subject of the sword and the trial. Uh, the first time I was introduced to Charles Spurgeon and knew that there was a movement abroad in this country to begin to preach Reformed theology of the Reformation, I picked up a, a little magazine, paper magazine that I, I had had, a little newsletter that somebody had given me at some time and I, it was in my office over there. And I looked at it and it said, The Sword and the Trial. And that was the name of Spurgeon's newsletter that he sent out I, I, on a weekly or, or a monthly basis. And I never really researched to find out why he named it that particular name. And I still don't know. But I know this morning that as we bring this message, at the end of the message, is going to be a scenario where you could say that this magazine was named after the sword and the trial. In other words, uh, the tools that are, are work, used to work and to build buildings and to uh, take plaster and put between the bricks. And if Wayne Nichols was here this morning, we'd let him give us an illustration. Uh, he was in Howard's store the other day, and he was telling everybody that he used to, they used to grab the bricks from one end of the finger up their shoulders when they were taking them to be laid. And he said, I one time took 90 bricks on my right arm. And you can believe that if you want to. But knowing Brother Nichols, it may have been an exaggeration. But Nehemiah is an interesting uh, character. He, uh, he was in exile. He was a, a high official uh, of the king of Persia. And yet, he was Jewish. So he began to see that there were problems in Jerusalem. They had been in exile for a long time and they had begun to return to Jerusalem some of the Jews back in the Old Testament. Now they the Jews that went there wanted to rebuild Jerusalem. They wanted to rebuild the temple and continue the worship of their God. They had been in exile in a foreign country for uh, a long, long time, and, and they weren't really able to worship as they wanted to worship. And as God so often does, in His providence, He placed them in a situation where that this king began to be friendly to them. God hardened the Pharaoh's heart, heart when, when He sent Moses to him, and, and that was not a good result for Pharaoh. This particular king, he made to have warm feelings for the Jews. And, and God will, will take situations and he will, he will move in people's lives and he will influence things in, in people's lives. Because he is a creator. We are creatures and, and we all belong to him. And, and there's a very low view of God in this society today. Because even in the church world, world, in the charismatic aspect of it in, in particular, God's looked at as a, 
uh, a handy tool or, or a, a celestial Santa Claus who's supposed to take care of all of our needs to make us happy, to make us wealthy, to make us wise. And that's what, what the purpose of God is. The purpose of God is being the creator is to do according to his will at the goodness of his pleasure. We, we are so haughty, we think we're above God, and we, can't, we, we think we can dictate to God. But we don't know who God is in reality. God is a great creator. He owns all of his creation. He is in possession of it. It belongs to him. And he can do what he would like with his creation. And he is a, a, a being who also has mercy and he has grace. Or else we would not be sitting in this place today if God had not had mercy upon us and if God had not loved us. But the Jews were, were isolated. They wanted to go back to Judea. And so Nehemiah had a burden to go back. And in the first chapter, the first verse, it says, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hatchaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chrysalu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judea, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. So he got a report from Jerusalem. And the poor report was not a good one. The, the country had been overrun. There, there were people in disarray. Uh, the temple had been practically destroyed. The gates had been broken. And so Nehemiah, Nehemiah became sad for Jerusalem. Now, we understand this morning that I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to preach the story of Nehemiah and the wall. And then I'm going to take elements of that story in the scripture and I'm going to compare them with things which are similar in the New Testament, in particular concerning Jesus. Now, let me say immediately before uh, I get into the sermon, I'm not going to say this morning that everything that I compare is going to be prophetic. Every comparison I make does not mean that this New Testament prophecy is fulfilled by what I read in the Old Testament. Uh, that's not my purpose. The purpose is to simply take the events that happened in Nehemiah's life and compare them with the events that happened in the New Testament and in the life of Jesus. No exegetical uh, correlation whatsoever, no prophetic meaning, uh, unless we may stumble across one, but, but that's not the point. I want us to see uniquely and interestingly how the life of Nehemiah and his journey compared with the life and the journey of our Lord Jesus Christ right up to the day. So it's just an interesting comparison that I'll be making today. The first comparison is that Nehemiah was, was sad for Judea. Uh, he was upset about Judea. And, and we see that that in verse 4 it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. When he saw the condition that Jerusalem was in and the temple was in, he became 
very upset. And he, he became very disillusioned and he wanted to do something about it and he will. Because it was important to him. It was important to him to go there and worship God. It was important to him that, that his people have a place to worship God. And, and the honor of God, he was weeping for the honor of God, which had been desecrated in Jerusalem. Jesus, one time, also was sad for Jerusalem. <clears throat> he said something to the effect one time, that I, I weep over you, Jerusalem, as a, a mother hen would weep. And he says, I would take the wings as of a mother hen and place around you and cuddle you and love you. So Jesus, too, had a similar uh, thought pattern in his mind. He loved Jerusalem as well. And it said the gates were destroyed. Uh, the gates in Jerusalem had been destroyed. The walls had been broken down. And when they got there, they saw that there was rubble on the ground and everything was in disarray. Jesus, when he died, had another wall that was really broken down. It wasn't a wall made of, of, of stone like in Nehemiah's time, but it, it was a veil in the temple. When Jesus died, the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom with an invisible porch by the hand of God. And the symbolism was that no longer would the Jewish people, and no longer would there be a need to go into the temple and the Holy of Holies and offer sacrifices of animals. The, the, the curtain was, was very, very thick in the Holy of Holies. And, and, it, and no one could go in there but the high priest. And the offerings had to be made year after year, but they, they never really lasted. And so, when Jesus died, he was the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice, who was given for sin one time, and never again would you need a sacrifice in the Old Testament temple. Never again would you need the sacrificial system in the past. Because that system had in its makeup the sacrifice of animals which were not perfect and they had to be repeated and they did not remove sin. They just covered it. But when Jesus came, he removed sin once and for all for his people forever and there never need to be another sacrifice again. The middle wall of petition. And then I want us to read in the second chapter, if you flip over, I want us to read verses 1 and 2. Nehemiah. And it came to pass in the months of Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes, the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine, and I gave it unto the king. And now I had not been before time set sad in his presence. He, he was waiting on the king, and he, he, he waited on the king often, but he was always happy. He was always pleased, but his heart was heavy on this particular day. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. And then I was sore afraid. He became fearful that the king noticed his countenance. And then we look at verse 4. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make a request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant hath found favor in thy sight, and thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchre, that I may build it. So he found favor in the eyes of the king. God had moved the cut upon Xerxes or to Xerxes, and he had he had given him a tender feeling toward Nehemiah. And he, he really he loved Nehemiah. And he asked a favor. 
Can I go, dear king, back to Jerusalem, back to Judea, and rebuild the temple, and rebuild the place that we can worship, me and my people? He found favor in the sight of the king. Jesus also asked that question. In, in, in theology, there's what is called the everlasting covenant, which means that before the foundation of the world, there was a covenant made between the Godhead. Or you can call it an agreement. Some people get upset when you call it a covenant. But you can call it an agreement. You can call it a discussion. You can call it what you like, but it is inconceivable that Jesus would have been sent to this world without a conversation between the Godhead taking place. The covenant, everlasting covenant. And the decision was made that Jesus would not go to Jerusalem, would not go back to rebuild the walls of the temple, but that Jesus, much like Nehemiah, would go and come into this world and enter a human body, and he would die for the sins of his people. Because he loved his people. And he loves those that he's going to die for the ones the Father has given unto him. And so he also came. He also had a love for his people. And then we look in the second chapter of the sixth verse. And it says in the sixth verse, And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, for how long shall the journey be? And when will thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I sent him a time. The king wanted to know when he would be sent and when he was coming back, Nehemiah. And so the king sent him. When God the Father sent Jesus into the world, as we compare the two, he had a set period of time that Jesus would walk the face of the earth. And you say, how do I know that? I know that because God is omniscient. He knows everything, and there's nothing unto him that is not known. It was not an accident that Jesus came. It was a well-thought-out plan and we don't know because we weren't there whether Jesus asked to go or whether the Father asked him to go. I, I, I don't want to get into that because we really don't have a definitive answer. But either way, it was similar to Nehemiah. Jesus wanted to go. We know that. We know that he wanted to go. We know that he desired to come and we know that he desired to come and to, as horrible as it was, to hang on the cross and die for the sins of his people. So they're similar in that respect. Then we see in the seventh verse of the second chapter. Moreover, I said unto the king, Nehemiah speaking, if it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come unto Judea. He asked the king for letters. He knew when he got there, he would be a stranger. He knew when he got there, there was a different group of people ruling Jerusalem. And he needed these official letters from the king because these people feared Artaxerxes and they also respected his kingship and they also knew about his power and his military power. So he wanted letters to get him in the front door, you might say, and to be able to have credibilities, credibility. And you know, God did the same thing for Jesus. Before God sent Jesus into the world, God wrote letters that would verify who he was. He wrote letters and books which would give Jesus the divinity when he got here. He wrote letters and books which actually prophesied and said in the future in advance 
that in the future, my son is coming and the Messiah is coming. And when he does, receive him. And they're written all through the Old Testament of this book. The entire Old Testament, in essence, was looking forward to Jesus and his coming. He wasn't well received. Nehemiah, we found out later, wasn't well received. The people there hated him and they resisted him. And neither was Jesus well received. Can you imagine that the, the sovereign God of the universe wrote letters to the Jewish leaders and everyone else, and us too, that his son was coming. I'm sending my son to you. If, if, if we wouldn't be an email, but we, we know today that we are here. And we know that they probably corresponded with Jack and Henrietta and others in Hollywood before they came. And Henrietta probably said, I've got a house in case you don't know where you can probably stay when you come. And there was a the communication. But when she saw that her son was coming and, and when she saw that he was bringing his wife who she loves and Renee, then he, she prepared the place. Believe me, she's prepared the place many, many times for many, many people. And probably hundreds of people. But she was glad that they were coming. She responded. She didn't treat them the way that the Pharisees and the Jews treated Jesus. She didn't treat him the way that the Israelites, his own people, treated Jesus. She did not treat them the way that people today in our culture treat the Lord Jesus and look upon him. His enemies, those that are his enemies. But she received them with love and thanksgiving. And when we found out they were coming, we, we received them with love and thanksgiving. And so, Jesus was not well received, and neither was Nehemiah. And then, if we look at the second chapter and the ninth verse, it says this, Then I came to the governor's beyond the river. He's in Jerusalem now in Judea. And they gave him the king's letters. He came to the rulers who were in charge of Jerusalem and he gave them the king's letter. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. He's telling the story. And Nehemiah arrives in, in Jerusalem. He gives, he gives the king the letters. He, 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 he has a horseman and he has the king's men there as protection as he goes. As Jesus entered the world, I believe that he had an army of angels watching over him, watching over Mary, watching over Joseph watching over the manger where they lay. And they were probably all around in his own entire ministry, ready to spring into action if he needed them, or if God chose to do that. He's always had his angelic protection, whether he chose to lose them, to use them, or not. And then we go on to verse 10. When Sambalat and Hornite and, and Tobia, the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. We have throughout the Middle East today nations and countries who do not seek the welfare of the nation of Israel. Amen. They want to destroy Israel so bad they can hardly stand it. Right. Amen. And not only is it a physical dilemma, and a political dilemma, and a military dilemma, but one of the basis and one of the foundation blocks of why this hatred exists 
is because of a spiritual dilemma because they serve a different God than the Jewish people serve. Amen. They do not serve Jehovah God. They relegated Jesus to be a mere prophet. And their God says to the Islamic nations, go and conquer and make them submit. Kill the infidels. And, and why do that? Why don't we go ahead and kill each other? Do you know as a war goes on in Syria, you have the Syrians who are aligned with the Shia. You have Saudi Arabia and, and, and you have uh, probably Jordan, uh, parts of Egypt and other nations who are uh, a different branch uh, of Islam. And they hate each other and they're trying to destroy each other. That's not a very good testimony for your God that because Muhammad's kin people got the wrong predecessor or, or person that, that took over when he died, you hate each other to this day. But there's a lot of hatred. And not only that, in comparing this with Nehemiah, I would imagine that when Jesus was sent into the world, there was one that grieved. Sambalot grieved because somebody came to do good for the Jewish people. Some things never change. This is my own opinion. This is not basically going to be coming from a verse I'm going to read. But I would imagine that when Satan found out that Jesus was in the world, and I know that he found out by the time that he took him out in the wilderness and tempted him, that he was grieved. Because he knows that's not a good thing. And he began to work in trying to destroy the Lord Jesus. And then we look at the book of Nehemiah again. And we see in verse 11 and 12. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Listen, it, I, I don't know if there's any prophetic meaning with all this. And I don't know if I've ever seen a scholar say it. But there are a lot of very, com, very close relationships between Nehemiah and Jesus. He came and he stayed three days. Jesus came and he stayed three years, basically, on this earth. And when Jesus died and he went into the grave, he stayed three days in the grave or wherever he was at that time and whatever he was doing. Another coincidence. Another similar thing that both <clears throat> were able to do. And then we see verse 17, and it says, Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem that we may be no more of a reproach. He had a few men with him, and he had come to begin to build the walls. In verse 12, he had said, we are few men except the beast to ride upon. Jesus was very simple. When Jesus got ready to die, when he was facing the cross, he wasn't able to come to the cross. 
with a group of followers, with protection. But when he went to the garden, he was basically by himself because the disciples slept while he prayed in the garden. When he went to the hall of judgment, everyone fled except Peter, and then Peter still denied him he was by himself. And when he hung on the cross, suspended between heaven and earth, he was by himself. And even while on the cross, he said, My Father, my Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Because God could not look upon sin. And he was alone, like Nehemiah, was feeling very much alone. Verse 13, if we go back. He says, I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well. We talked about dragons in Sunday school. And to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. They were consumed with fire. They were in bad shape. Then we see that in verse 19, back to 19. But when Sambalat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshen, and Abraham heard it, Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? So they came there. They were trying to rebuild the walls of the city. They had a letter from the king, the authorization. And yet these guys who were in charge did not want them to rebuild the walls. They did not like them. They hated them. And they laughed them to scorn and they even said in a verse or two later, if a fox comes along, the fox can even knock down the wall that you're trying to rebuild. They made fun of them. When Jesus, in comparison, hung upon the cross, the people on the ground, some of them cried out, and they said, even before that, even, even before he went to the cross, Pilate asked them, shall I release who shall I release unto you? Because he could release one, one prisoner. And they all cried out, Give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. And he said, Well, what should I do with Jesus, your king of the Jews? And he said, Take him and crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. They laughed him to scorn. And as he hung the cross, they cried out and they said, if, if you be with a God, if you who you say you are, bring yourself down from the cross. And they scorned him and they laughed at him. And they made fun of him, like they made fun of Nehemiah. Then we go to verse 20. Then answered I them and said unto them, 2.20, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Nehemiah said, we will rise and we will build. And nothing can stop us from building. We will arise and we will build. Jesus, when he rose from the dead, victorious over death, victorious over sin, and victorious over Satan, was victorious, and God gave him authority, and he went back to heaven. And Jesus didn't say this. You won't find this said like this in the Scripture. But in essence, what he could have said, 
was I am going back to heaven. I am not going to arise, but I have already arisen from the dead. And I'm going back to heaven not to build walls, not to build the, the, the gate of the, of the fly and the donkey and all the other things that Nehemiah was building. But you know what he said? He said, for you, for you that belong to me, I am going back to heaven, I have arisen, I'm arising to go back to heaven, and I'm going to begin to build. Just like Nehemiah, he said, I'm going back, and I'm going to build. And he actually said, I'm going back, and I'm going to build. And he said, I'm going to build mansions for you. In my Father's house are many mansions, he said. And we don't know exactly what that means. He may have meant in the entire universe, which is my Father's house, there are many mansions and, and planets and everything else. Or he may have specifically meant that he's going to actually build us mansions that we can live in when we get to heaven. But he's there, and just like me and I, he is building. And then very quickly, we continue in verse, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. The Elishas, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priest, and they built up the sheep gate. They sanctified it, and they set up the doors of it. Even under the tower of Mia, they sanctified it under the tower of Hanil. And next to him, building the men of Jericho. And next to them, building Sakor, the son of Emmer. And you look here, and there's a whole complete chapter of different groups of men who are building different parts of the temple. If you compare that with the life of Jesus, and if you compare that with the story of Jesus, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, he said, I go you into all the world and preach the gospel. And beloved, since Jesus' death, that's what's been happening. The Holy Spirit has been rebuilding the spiritual temple of God, His universal church. And they've gone into every part of the world and they've built churches. And they brought believers together in groups and, and they have formed little units and organizations and little cells all across the world. So they're all working together to build God's kingdom. And then the seventh and eighth verses of that same chapter. But it came to pass that when Samlat and Tobias I don't know how they have to mention all these guys' names over and over and over. I get, I get to, I'm just going to skip them. I'm not even going to say them. They heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and Jerusalem and that the breaches began to be stopped, but they were very rough. I'm supposing that the word rough means they were very mad and they were very angry. Verse 8, and conspired all of them together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. The enemy planned to attack them. And beloved, if we compare Nehemiah's time to the present day, the time of Jesus, ever since Jesus rose from the dead, Satan knew that his, his future and his fate was sealed. And he has been attacking the church of God. And he has been attacking the children of God ever since. Trying to do as much damage as he can do. But what should we do? Verse 14 tells us. Chapter 4, 14. And I got two more verses. One more verse. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be ye not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. This is uh, Nehemiah speaking. And fight for your brother, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. But he says, Remember the Lord, who is great and terrible, 
the great God of the universe is merciful and loving, but against his enemies and those who are evil, he can be great and he can be terrible. And he will fight to fight against these people. And beloved, he will fight the fight for us. When you get saved and the Holy Spirit comes to live within you, he will be with you and he will watch over you and he'll protect you. He may allow you to go through some things that are good for us. There may be some things to build our strength and trials and tribulations. But he's always got our best at heart. And he will never do anything to harm us out of hatred or bitterness. But he will be protective of us. And the last verse, the sword and the trial verse. It's pretty bad to announce the title and you don't even mention it again to the very last verse. Verse 17, chapter 4. They which build on the wall, and they that bear burdens, with those that had laid every one with every one of his hands, brought to the work, and with the other hand held a weapon. The sword and the trial. The trial. As those men, knowing that the enemy was still there to harass them and attack them, and to keep them from building the wall, they decided they would have their troll to scoop up the cement and put down so they could build the blocks and have some adhesive to hold them together. They held a trial in one hand and they held the sword in the other hand to guard the enemy and to fend off the enemy. And maybe, just maybe, that's where Spurgeon got the idea for his magazine. I don't really know. But if he did, it would be a good place. The sword and the trial. And that's what Spurgeon did. He kept his hand and his eyes and his preaching on the Word of God, preaching to people throughout London and all across the world. But then he did it with what the Bible calls the sword of the Spirit, and that is this particular book. Amen. The Bible calls it the sword of the Spirit. The weapon against Satan. The weapon against sin. The weapon against the enemies of Christ. The weapon that you will need spiritually because when you pick it up and you read from it or you preach from it, there are going to be people in certain quarters who are going to see this book as their enemy and they're going to attack it. And they're not going to like what it says because it convicts them of their sin. So thank you for your patience this morning. And I, I hope that as you leave, you can remember to do what you do in your job every day. Serve the Lord the best you can. Be a witness for Him. And yet, keep this sword very close for protection and for study and for learning and for really just finding out how to live life. Within the pages of this book are the words of salvation and those are the most important of all. Pray that you guys will have a good day. And I thank again our visitors for coming. I'm going to ask that Brother Howie would lead us in our closing prayer, please. Wow.